朵。Hey guys, what's up? This is episode number four of Design Over Time, and this is the series where we talk about game design topics over time because games are so complicated. There's so many things to talk about. The only good way to tackle it is slowly building up our understanding of games over time. So this is a daily series. We get five episodes a week, and this is the episode for Friday. I uh, hope you guys have been tuning in. There's a playlist and there's a Twitter account and all that stuff to follow along. But we are going to jump right into today's episode because we are talking about my favorite Kirby game of all time. Here we go. Where, where are my hands? Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. All right. So we're going to jump right into the notes. Yeah, this is my favorite Kirby game of all time. And it's... Well, I, I actually, I'll just show you the list here. Right here. So as far as Kirby 2D action platformer games go, um, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse is my favorite. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse and then followed by Kirby Canvas Curse. So I was a big fan of Canvas Curse when it came out on the DS, 100% of the game. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I thought it was great, but then Kirby and the Rainbow Curse for the Wii U came along and it pretty much improved on just about every aspect of the game. So that's something interesting that we can talk about. But then, you know, there's Mass Attack and Return of Dreamland and Superstar Saga and Dream Course and all the way down. But uh, this game is really good and we are going to jump into a very small reason why I like this game in this episode. We're not going to cover the entire game, but this should be good for giving you an idea of what it's about. So yeah, everything in the game is perfect or nearly perfect and there's tons of variety. Yeah, yeah, we, you, you're not really here for my review of it. We're really here to talk about different design aspects and how we can better understand Kirby and the Rainbow Curse and other video games based on um, the example that it sets. That's so cool. Yay! Bust out my stylus here. Alright, so that's my file. 100%. Uh, so yeah, this game features a story mode. And as you can see, you know, three levels per world and a boss level. So that's four per world total. And seven, seven total worlds, each with a different theme, as you might expect. Very classic for platformers. But what I want to show you today is, in fact, the challenge mode. Okay, so Kirby and the Rainbow Curse has a challenge mode, and cha this challenge mode has 48 levels of pure gameplay. And what I mean by this is, there's, there's really no story, there's really no transitions either, it's just pretty much challenge to challenge to challenge, as you might expect from a, a challenge mode. And the challenge mode actually features a lot of interesting designs and decisions that I think really clean up and focus everything on just completing the challenges and enjoying the gameplay ideas as they're presented. And one of the things that's different in challenge mode versus most of the encounters in the main game is that challenge mode has a single screen uh, setup. So, you know, there's no scrolling cameras or anything. It's all just whatever you can see on your touch screen. And that makes everything pretty um, consistent as far as when you put your stylus down, where the, the rainbow rope goes and, and what you can expect out of Kirby. So that's just a little thing. There's nothing wrong with the, the panning camera in the main game, but this is just something that's a little bit more consistent, a little bit more clean. Uh, that's why it's a feedback issue. This color right here is feedback and camera design definitely falls under that. This purple color here is modes and feature and this yellow color is level design. So that's pretty much what we're talking about right now. Uh, each of these challenges has four stages and each stage is 15 seconds each. And in that way, it's a lot like WarioWare, where in WarioWare, um, you just get thrown into a challenge and those are micro challenges, and you're expected to complete these challenges in about five seconds, roughly, three to five seconds. This is a little bit longer, so it's somewhere in between, but you, you get the picture. Uh, in WarioWare, you get a word that pops up right at the beginning of the challenge, like dig, and you have to figure out what dig means and get the job done. But uh, with Rainbow Curse's challenge mode, there are no word-based instructions. They just open up the screen and you, you go from there and you quickly have to scan the room from the start and figure out what you need to do. So I'll show you exactly what that looks like right here. So yeah, one minute challenge. You have 15 seconds per room to get the treasure chest from each of the four rooms. So right here you're like, oh, I'm Kirby over here. I'm going to draw a line around these spikes and get to the treasure chest. And this is the first challenge in the game, so obviously it's going to be the easiest one. Similar situation here. And sometimes you think 15 seconds is uh, a lot of time or not a lot of time, but man, when you're playing these challenges, you, you wish you had more time half the time. Like this, I'm kind of running low. 
and only had two seconds to spare. And if you get all four challenges done, you get a gold medal. And because I've 100 percent into the game, I've gotten a gold medal in each and every single one of these. But that's basically the gist of this challenge mode. So you got four levels, or four stages, per challenge. And you have 48 total. These ones at the end are these gold gauntlet challenges. What are they called, actually? Survival challenge. And you have to get all the treasure chests, and if you fail to get one, it just kicks you out, so it's game over. Uh, so this one's like 12 different challenges in a row. You gotta be careful on that one. Just hitting a bumper will set you back so much. So this one is similar to the one we saw before. There's not very many levels in the game that actually take the same idea and iterate on it. There's, no, I mean, not many levels in the challenge mode that do that. But as you can see, this one's a little trickier because they add these blocks that you can't crash through uh, with your Super Kirby power. And if you complete all of them in these survival challenges, which there are 12 to 14, I think, uh, different challenges in a row, you get the gold medal for that one. So the survival challenges at the end of each set of challenges is obviously harder than the previous ones. But So each challenge in these Kirby challenge presents a unique gameplay challenge or idea, and each of them have little to no iterative or linear variation. And you saw that, that one example where Kirby has to power up and go into the top level. Uh, sometimes they offer little twists to the rules, so you're like, oh, if you've done this before, here's an extra layer to the challenge. But for the most part, each of these ideas are uh, pretty unique. They don't do this iterative design kind of idea, and uh, that's, that makes for a total of about 200 different level design game ideas across this entire mode. Uh, each challenge room has about enough level creativity as you would find in a Super Mario Bros. 3 level. So here's what I mean by that. If we take uh, Super Mario Bros. 3 World 1-1, we go into the world map. Alright, this game's so good. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you guys see what I'm talking about. This area right here, this area right here is a complete game idea. It's kind of large, but the idea is like, oh, jump on stuff, hit boxes, avoid enemies, and it pretty much stops uh, right here where the, the land rises up a little bit. This is another complete game idea. You know, chaining off of Goomba, uh, using your tail if you can if you can hit this Koopa, you can use this uh Tanuki tail to fly up here, but this is like one uh, single setup area. If you ignore this, the bonus area up here, this lower area is a clear game idea. It's got bouncing turtles and it has a turtle on bottom, you know, a simple pit that separates them. And this final area over here is its own unique idea. You got a Koopa, you kick into this little playground of sorts, and you can get the secret switch and get some extra coins. And that's its own unique idea. It's got its own cleverness to it. So we're going to ignore secrets for now. But the main level in this level has about four major ideas or sections to them. If you, if you consider it like that, each of these Kirby challenges are like their own Super Mario Bros. 3 level. And that kind of makes this entire challenge mode uh, have an additional 50, approximately 50 levels to the game. And I think that's pretty remarkable considering there's a full single player game that doesn't feature any of these specific setups, but it has all these same elements. Um, but what's also interesting about challenge mode is that because it's a separate mode, you don't they, the individual challenges don't need to be prefaced, they don't need to be developed, as in uh, introduced with tutorials or anything like that. So you just jump straight into these and you have to go. There's no like, do you remember how 
bounces work? Do you remember how these elements work? Okay, here's this element in a safe place. Okay, here's this element in a slightly more dangerous place. Okay, now we're going to develop it. It just cuts right to the chase, which is, I find pretty refreshing, pretty interesting. Uh, the challenges are unlocked generally as the player encounters new elements in the main game. So all these challenges aren't available right off the bat. Um, the more you do in the main game, the more that they unlock. The more challenges you do, you know, the more they unlock. So, so you do unlock them gradually. This prevents the player from encountering a challenge with an element that they've never seen before and never done the tutorial, the, the intro section for. So it just decreases the likelihood of that. I think that's a pretty good thing. This also means that the challenges on average are on a higher level of difficulty than what you find in the main game. Uh, just like I said, if they don't have to tutorialize any of this, then they can just cut straight to the chase. Uh, each of the challenges difficulty is self-contained with no suspended consequences that flow into the other stages in the challenge. And what I mean by that is, no matter how much you get hurt in a challenge, I'll try to show you one. Let's just try this. Okay, so let's, let's check out these guys. So no matter how much damage I take in this mode, if I don't pass this challenge, on the next stage I have full health again. So really, each of these challenges are... Pause you. Stop. So each of these challenges are self-contained. Um, it doesn't matter how much damage you take on a previous uh, mini stage, it doesn't matter how many stars you collect. Each of them are completely independent of each other and they're just four different things back to back. Uh, so that's what I mean by eliminating any suspended consequences that you might uh, worry about when you're designing these things. I think this allowed the team to just completely design them independently and then stick them together as needed. Uh, so that's a pretty good thing. You know, random side note, uh, the next Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, I think is doing a similar approach with their temples, what are they called? Sanctuaries? Something like that. Uh, they're, they're taking a very similar approach where they seem to have a bunch of these areas that are self-contained, um, their challenges, and they said there was hundreds of them in the game, so I'd imagine that they either had a daily challenge of making these things within their team, or they just let other people in their team design these things so they could get a lot of them in there, but I'm really looking forward to that. Anyway, side note, moving on. So it can be frustrating not to have any extra time to practice some of the challenges that come later in the set, and this forces you to go back through the whole thing if you want another chance uh, to practice, another chance at a gold medal. But, you know, that's life. Uh, these challenges are supposed to be challenging, and you're supposed to have been exposed to these elements uh, with plenty of time to learn how they work previously in the game. And even though 15 seconds seems like a short amount of time, you do have just about enough time to handle everything and solve the, uh, overcome the challenge on your first encounter with it. So anything else is just you panicking, you not quite understanding the, um, the range of control you have, you making bad choices, and that's all on you, so perfectly acceptable, it's just frustrating sometimes. You know, the, every time I introduce these colored topics, I'm pretty much referring to the color coding system that we built into Design Oriented. Uh, you'll see here that, you know, everything on this wheel, which we're still working on, has a specific color and everything matches up. Everything should be consistent across our website, across our, our imagery, our, our infographics, and our videos, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we're mainly talking about, wait, right here, level design, which includes a lot of these subtopics, which we'll tackle on another day. But um, level design, we talked a little bit about feedback with camera design. You can see it right there. Um, we are talking about design space now, which, you know, design space is a way of organizing and understanding the various elements that gameplay and levels are composed of. It outlines the game's potential as well as its functional creative limitations. It's just the uh, canvas that designers can paint on, as Damien Schubert once said. Here we're talking about uh, the feature, the mode and feature that is challenge mode. Where, did I do mode and feature? Okay, modes and features, just purpley color. Various modes and gameplay variants right here. So yeah, many puzzle games feature an action-based challenge mode. Uh, if you talk about Box Boy, you can talk about Base 10. You can consider Tetris DS and even Tetris Attack. All these games have these various um, action puzzle modes aside from their turn-based um, linear puzzle mode, right? They have an action puzzle mode on top of their puzzle mode. Hopefully that's not too confusing. If you played these games, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. Many action games feature a challenge or a puzzle mode. Um, if you talk about Bionic Commando, that's a 2D uh, platformer action style game. 
but it features a challenge mode where you are strictly platforming around these various obstacle courses. Uh, New Super Mario Bros. U features a challenge mode. Mega Man 10 has its own challenge mode where it's a separate menu and you can select individual bosses to battle, individual mini bosses, or even I think they have some robot master weapon based challenges too. So that's why another reason I really like Mega Man 10 over Mega Man 9. Perfect Dark has a shooting gallery and it also has a challenge mode built into its multiplayer that's one to four players for about 50 challenges if I remember correctly. It was a ton of them, golly. <laughs> Van Gallon Spirits is a 2D side-scrolling missile based shoot 'em up twin stick style game. But it also has a, a, a separate mode in its menu they call puzzle mode. So those levels are more cerebral, they're more thought-oriented in that you have to figure out the sequences of stuff and figure out slight nuances and things instead of just shooting everything with your missiles. And of course Kirby Return to Dreamland has its own challenge mode that I really, really liked. Uh, strategy games often use linear puzzle challenges to teach because they, instead of embracing the entire strategy gameplay, they just really want you to focus on one aspect, so they narrow things down and, and restrict things in a way that helps you focus on that aspect. Uh, Sheer and the Wanderer for the DS has that, Subterfuge for the iOS has that as well. But this is just, this is just a quick rundown of all these different games that do different things with their modes, and uh, it's kind of important for this reason, so now we're talking about design space. And this is what we're going to conclude on. Uh, one way or another, a game's design space contains all of its potential. Some games do a lot with a little, and other games do not do enough with what they have. Most games cannot create gameplay challenges for every possibility. This is just something that we all know intuitively. If a game cannot create a challenge mode or a puzzle mode, perhaps it doesn't have enough design space to make a decent mode out of it. Uh, being able to create challenge mode or alternate modes of a game shows the breadth and versatility of its design space. Uh, if a game's main level design features secrets, exploration, story, or a mix of different gameplay types, then each type may not be strong enough to support its own challenge mode. I mean, that's just kind of um, the give and take of making these more complex game systems, right? You take a game like Zelda and it's a mix between exploration, it's a mix between uh, puzzles, you know, in their dungeon and even in their uh, NPCs and overworld, it's a mix between combat and, you know, whatever, story, if you will. Uh, it, it tries to find the middle point so that, you know, the gamer who doesn't specialize in any one of those genres can enjoy Zelda as sort of a mix. So, you know, that means finding that middle point may come at the sacrifice of developing the, the best possible game that it can possibly be, or developing the, the most challenging deep combat that it can possibly have. But, you know, that's, that's just a give and take that you experience whenever you're making any kind of complex design. But with that said, it doesn't necessarily mean those elements are weaker or can't um, hold up on their own. It just means that you'd expect the designers to make some kind of trade-off when they're designing. So a lot of games work by creating one main game with levels or stages or whatever, and then they give the player the option to play different loadouts or characters. Uh, this style doesn't show us the versatility of the design space as much as it gives the players more room to play around it. Uh, there's games like Luthrausers, there's games like Kid Icarus Uprising, there's even games like um, Super Smash Brothers. They give you lots of characters to play around with and you're supposed to play through the game uh, with your character and be like, well that was cool, and then of course you can get a different gameplay experience by changing your loadout, changing your character, but for the most part the, the main game's challenges is fixed and you can experience different aspects of the, the challenge by playing a different character, but ultimately it's the same thing. This is something that's entirely different from making challenge mode levels. Uh, level design is something different from the character that you pick or the loadout that you select to go into the level. And even though you can design levels to be kind of to show their versatility depending on what option you pick going into it, for the most part when we're talking about level design we're talking about what gameplay setups and ideas and experiences that developers are crafting for you to experience uh, instead of what aspect of the singular experience they want you to, to see. So it's, it's about a variety of ideas instead of different angles on the same idea. But yeah, talking about level design is really tricky. Uh, there's a lot to it, and we will explore a thorough way to break down level design in the coming weeks right here on Design Over Time. So yeah, let me know if you want a full breakdown comparison between Kirby and the Rainbow Curse and Kirby and Canvas Curse for the Nintendo DS. Um, these are two games that I know really, really well, and these are two of my favorite Kirby games, so I can really break down the really uh, nuanced aspects of every 
element of its design from its controls to its camera to its level design to just about anything you can think of. So let me know if you want to see something like that on design over time. Uh, but hopefully you have a better idea of level design and what Kate Kirby Rainbow Curse has to offer and what challenge modes and other modes really do for a game's design and helping you understand what they're about and what they're capable of. This has been the fourth episode of Design Over Time. You can follow me at Kirby Kid, or you can follow Design Oriented, which I highly recommend. Follow this channel for daily updates on this video series and get back to me with your questions. You can leave them down in the comments or you can send them to me on Twitter. Either way, just make sure you get your questions out there so I can answer them either on the spot or in a video if the question is juicy enough. But yeah, it's been a good week. We hope to see you guys next week and I will see you guys next time.